10 Strangest Creepy Unsolved Mysteries from Australia Australia might not have a long history, but Australia have many more mysteries that simply refuse to be solved. Maybe you could be the one who solves them. Number 10. Beaumont Children Disappearance The Beaumont children were three siblings, Jane Narter Beaumont, born September 10, 1956, Arna Kathleen Beaumont, born November 11, 1958, and Grant Ellis Beaumont, born July 12, 1961, who disappeared from Glenelg Beach near Adelaide, South Australia, on Australia Day, January 26, 1966. At the time of their disappearance they were aged 9, 7 and 4 respectively. Their case resulted in one of the largest police investigations in Australian criminal history and remains one of Australia's most infamous cold cases, even after many decades. At 10 a.m. on January 26, Jane, Arna and Grant said goodbye to their mother Nancy. They left their home in the Adelaide suburb of Somerton Park to catch a bus to Glenelg Beach. It was a five-minute bus trip. They were meant to return home at 2.30 p.m. that day, but it wasn't until some five hours later that their worried parents called police. A major manhunt and one of the nation's biggest ever police investigations followed. A shopkeeper at Glenelg remembers Jane buying pasties and a pie that day with a one-pound note, even though her mother hadn't given her that much money. Witnesses saw the children playing with a tall, stand thin-faced man in his thirties with short blonde hair. The disappearance of the children received massive publicity. Numerous sightings were reported, but none of the leads went anywhere. None of the children's clothes or bags were ever found. For many years, the parents refused to move from their Somerton Park house. Nancy said it would be dreadful if the children came home and they weren't there. The couple eventually separated. They no longer live in the house. This latest lead comes from Andrew McIntyre. Andrew and his sister Ruth Collins both believe their father Alan Max McIntyre and his friend Monroe were involved in the disappearance of the Beaumont children. Monroe is a convicted pedophile who lived in Glenelg in 1966. Andrew is one of his victims. Monroe is jailed in 1990 for sexually abusing a child. Andrew claims his diary provides proof that his father and Monroe spent time at Glenelg Beach in the days before the Beaumont children went missing, and on the actual day. Witnesses saw a blonde man aged within his thirties that day, a description that matches Monroe's appearance at the time. According to Andrew's diary, the day the Beaumont children vanished Andrew McIntyre was meant to go diving with his father and Monroe, but was later told to stay home. When the pair arrived home both reportedly looked downcast, with Andrew McIntyre claiming his father had his head in his hands and said, shit, shit, shit. He also claims that when they returned home, sand and blood was in Monroe's car. However, Monroe and Alan has always denied any involvement. Police have never found any evidence implicating them. To police in South Australia, this is still an open case. More than 50 years after that hot summer's day, the search for the Beaumont children still continues. Number 9. Disappearance of Ryanna Bear In October of 1992, 12-year-old Ryanna Bear was walking to her local mall in South Australia to buy a card for her American pen pal. She normally would have taken the bus, but bus drivers were on strike that day and Ryanna didn't want to wait. Her mother agreed that she could go to the mall said goodbye to her daughter, and headed off to work. Witnesses saw Ryanna walking along highway drive just before noon. This would be the last time anyone saw her. Ryanna's mother arrived home that afternoon to find the card for her daughter's friend lying on the dining room table and a record lying on the floor. The TV was blaring in an empty room. Calling Ryanna and receiving no reply, Miss Bear started looking. First inside the house, then outside eventually going to neighbors asking if they had seen Ryanna that day. No one had. Police were called, but Ryanna was never seen again and to this day no one knows what happened to her. In 2015, a police officer attempting to solve the now decades-old cold case offered up a reward of $1 million to anyone who had credible information on Ryanna Bear's disappearance. Nothing came of that either. 
After all these years, Ryan's mum still lives in the same house, hoping that one day her daughter might return, or she'll get some answers as to what happened. Number 8. Tainan North Serial Killings On December 6, 1980, a man dumping animal remains in Tainan North came across something that looked to him to be human bones. He immediately notified local police, who then proceeded to uncover the remains of three women. Two years later, the remains of a fourth victim was found in the same area. The fourth woman was Naramal Stevenson, who disappeared just a month before the remains were first found. Other victims were 14-year-old Kathir Headland and 73-year-old Bertha Miller, both of whom disappeared in August 1980, some 18 days apart, and 18-year-old Anne Marie Sargent, who went missing in October of the same year. One of the victims, 14-year-old Catherine Headland, was due to report for an afternoon shift at the local supermarket on August 28, 1980, where she worked part-time to earn some money to take care of her beloved horse, Prince. Catherine spent some time with her friends at her boyfriend's house that day before heading off to work. Little did she or any of her loved ones know that she would never return home. Her body was dumped next to that of 73-year-old Bertha Miller who had been abducted 18 days before. 18-year-old Anne Marie Sargent disappeared in October 1980, and her remains were found near Catherine and Bertha. Over the next three decades police named several suspect, and even link the Tainan North serial killings to two more murders in Frankston, but none have been solved. Despite an in-depth investigation by teams of police officers, they don't even know whether the killer is a single person or a team of murderers. Number 7. Vanishing Cessna 210 On August 9, 1981, a Cessna 210 was going from Proserpine to Sydney with four men on board. It was just a regular flight for 52-year-old pilot Michael Hutchins, until the plane reached Taria and he saw bad weather approaching. He requested permission to fly through restricted airspace to avoid the storm. Then, the pilot changed his mind, staying on his original course. Not long after that an integral part of the plane fails, leaving the pilot with no sense of direction and no horizon simulator or heading indicator. This meant Hutchins had no sense of direction, flying west toward the mountains instead of the coastline he was aiming for. Having to battle strong winds and ice along with vacuum pump failure would be trying for any pilot. The extreme turbulence seemed to be the last straw. The last response from Hutchins was a terrified 5,000, before complete silence. Air controllers could not find the emergency beacon or anything on the radar. Land and air searches involving hundreds of police, rescuers, and volunteers lasted nine days but yielded no sign of the plane. Another extensive search a month later only raised more unanswered questions. Searchers exhausted all avenues of help including the assistance of psychics and aviation experts, but the location of the plane and the fate of the passengers on board remains a mystery. Number 6. Case of Betty Shanks The case of Betty Shanks is one of the oldest and most notorious unsolved murder cases in Queensland, Australia. On the night of September 19, 1952, 22-year-old Betty Shanks got off a tram at Days Road Terminus in Grange, a suburb of Brisbane. Queensland, and started her short walk home. Her violently beaten body was found in the garden of a house on the corner of Carberry and Thomas Streets the next morning at 5.35 a.m., by a policeman who lived nearby. At the time it was Queensland's biggest criminal investigation ever, and as of 2010 a reward of 50,000 Australian dollars still current. An attack by a sex offender was considered very early in the investigation. Another theory is that the murderer attacked the wrong woman, and was actually interested in a doctor's receptionist, who also walked home down the same street at the same time, and had keys to the surgery which contained drugs. A number of people have confessed over the years, however all have proved to be false. This case still remains unsolved. Number 5. Disappearance of Frederick Valentich 
20-year-old Frederick Valentich disappeared while on a 235 kilometers training flight in a Cessna 182 liters light aircraft over Bass Strait in Australia on the evening of Saturday, October 21, 1978. Valentich had around 150 total hours of flying time. Described as a flying saucer enthusiast, Valentich radioed Melbourne Air Traffic Control that evening to inform that he was being accompanied by an aircraft about 300 meters above him. He reported that the aircraft was large, unknown to him, and moving at high speed. Not long after, he radioed in to say it was now orbiting above him, and that it had a shiny metal surface and a green light. His engine had begun running roughly before finally reporting, it's not an aircraft. There was the sound of metal scraping, and Valentich was never heard from again. A sea and air search was launched looking for the wayward pilot or any sign of his plane, but despite spanning over 1,000 square miles, nothing was found. Search efforts ceased four days later. There were belated reports of a UFO sighting in Australia on the night of the disappearance. However, Associated Press reported that the Department of Transport was skeptical a UFO was behind Valentich's disappearance, and that some of their officials speculated that Valentich became disorientated and saw his own lights reflected in the water, or lights from a nearby island, while flying upside down. Many theories have been suggested as to why Valentich reported what he did, some that say he likely saw a UFO, and others that suggest he was confused and simply made an error. Looks like we'll never know. Number 4. Luna Park Ghost Trained Firehorn In June 1979, a happy family was waiting for a ferry to transport them to Luna Park, a popular amusement park located in Sydney. Jenny and John Godson had looked forward to this moment for a long time, wanting to spoil their two young sons with a fun day out. After having visited the Taranga Zoo, they finally made their way to Luna Park where they had a whale of a time going on all the different rides the park has to offer. At the end of the night, the family had to make a final decision before leaving for home. Which ride would they spend their final four tickets on? The boys decided on the ghost train and headed off to the ride with their father while Jenny went off on a short detour for an ice cream. When she returned a few minutes later, she walked into a nightmare. Instead of seeing her husband and two boys having a fun ghost train ride, she saw smoke billowing from the train as it hurtled down the track and park employees trying desperately to get people off it each time it emerged from a tunnel. Jenny's husband and two boys, along with four other passengers, didn't make it out. Sometime after the tragedy, Jenny came across some of the photographs taken during that horrible day and stopped to stare at one in particular. A picture of her son Damien, the last one ever taken, shows the little boy shyly posing next to an intimidating figure wearing a demonic looking mask with horns on his head. They were unable to locate the man later. After the fact, comparisons were made between the figure and God Moloch, the god or demon depending on which version of the story you read. It is believed that Moloch preferred children to be burned alive as sacrifices. Was this a sinister way to offer up human sacrifices to an ancient god or was it deliberate arson in a business dispute as some others have claimed? Jenny Godson believed something evil was at work, but the mystery of exactly who the horned, masked man still remains. Number 3. The Summerton Man. The Summerton Man is probably one of the most internationally renowned of Australia's unsolved mysteries. Sometimes referred to as the Tamamshud case. It involves the discovery of a man's body on Somerton Beach in the morning of December 1, 1948. The case is referred to as such because, some months after the body was found, police uncovered a scrap of paper in the man's pocket on which was printed, Tamam Shud. The phrase means ended or finished in Persian. Police were unable to identify the man, although his autopsy suggested that he had not died of natural causes but had in fact been poisoned and possibly left at the beach, instead of having died there. Clues on his body seemed to lead to more questions, and it didn't get any easier when his suitcase was discovered six weeks after his body at a train station. The scrap of paper in his pocket came from a rare New Zealand edition of a book of poems, which police tracked down, someone had stashed it in the rear footwell of a car. 
Inside they found indentations of other writing, which they believe to be a code or encryption. The case of the Somerton Man is considered to be one of Australia's most profound mysteries, and has been since it was first uncovered. Years later there is no consensus as to who the man was, how he really died, how he came to be at Somerton Beach, or where he might have come from. A local woman named Jessica Thompson was linked to the case, but continued to claim she did not know the dead man. Some think he might have been a spy, but the truth is we'll never know. Number 2. The Case of Mr. Cruel. In the late 1980s and early 1990s an unknown man had the people of Melbourne terrified. He was known by the media as Mr. Cruel. In August of 1987 he broke into a Lower Plenty family home, armed, and tied up both parents and their son. An 11-year-old girl was attacked. Then in 1988 he broke into a home in Ringwood, kidnapped 10-year-old Sharon Wills, and held her for 18 hours before releasing her. He struck again in 1990, breaking into a Canterbury home and abducting 13-year-old Nicola Linus, whom he held and abused for 50 hours before releasing her. Mr. Cruel was also believed to be behind a break-in at a house in Templestowe in 1991, when 13-year-old Carmen Chan was kidnapped. She wasn't lucky enough to escape or be let go by Mr. Cruel. Her remains were found a year after her disappearance. She had been shot in the head multiple times. Because of the lack of evidence in the Carmen case, police cannot be completely sure that Mr. Cruel was behind her murder, but they believe he is the most likely suspect. In 2013, the police were still working on a list of more than 20 suspects. In working to solve the case of Mr. Cruel police have searched some 30,000 homes based on the kidnapped girl's description and interviewed around 27,000 suspects. There is currently a $300,000 reward available for information that leads to an arrest, but police have admitted that some vital evidence, which may provide DNA proof, has gone missing. The identity of Mr. Cruel remains a mystery. Number 1. Last Eater's Reef. Likely one of the most well-known and enduring of Australia's unsolved mysteries, Last Eater's Reef has entertained and eluded decades of searchers. It started in 1929 and 1930 when Harold Bell Last Eater made a number of conflicting claims that in 1897 he had found a large amount of gold in he dessert. Last Eater claimed that he had found a very rich vein of gold on his travels, something he described as a vast gold-bearing reef in central Australia, a fabulously rich gold deposit in a remote and desolate corner of central Australia. On October 14, 1929 he wrote a letter to Kalgoorlie federal member, Albert Green, claiming to have discovered a vast gold-bearing reef in central Australia 18 years earlier and that it was located at the western edge of the McDonnell Ranges. He made a similar claim to other officials and was interviewed by a commissioner and a geologist, however the government took no action to investigate the claim. In March 1930 he provided a different story to John Bailey of the Australian Workers' Union. In this claim Lass Eater details that as a young man of the age of 17, he rode on horse from Queensland to the West Australian goldfields, during which he stumbled across a huge gold reef somewhere near the border between the Northern Territory and Western Australia. However Lass Eater had been sentenced to reform school at that time. According to the story told to Bailey, Lasseter was about 1,100 kilometers west of Alice Springs in a line towards Kalgoorlie. He claimed that subsequent to this discovery he got into difficulties and was fortuitously rescued by a passing Afghan camel driver who took him to the camp of a surveyor, Joseph Harding. Harding and Lasseter were said to have later returned to the reef in the attempt to fix its location, but failed because their watches were inaccurate. As the expedition with Harding dated in the years before World War I, the two different versions about the finding of the reef could not have been conflicting, simply it is possible that Lasseter did refer sometimes to his first finding in 1897 and sometimes to the first expedition with Harding. Over the next several decades, Lasseter tried on several occasions to raise funds and find the gold reef, but he was never successful. When the gold rush finished in 1930, during the Great Depression, Lasseter was able to secure 50,000 pounds for an expedition to the reef. 
Their search party included motorized transport, an aircraft, and several experienced Bushmen, but they never found it. The myth continues today, and it has become a prominent Australian folk tale. It is perhaps the most famous lost mine legend in Australia, and remains a holy grail among Australian prospectors. Nobody knows if Lasseter was actually helming the truth, and we'll likely never know the truth. If you enjoy video, please subscribe my channel. Thank for watching.